Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And good evening, or good afternoon, whatever the case may be. You know, it's hard to believe. I, I just can't comprehend that our program is now available from coast to coast on satellite, and that means that some people are watching it in the evening hours on Saturdays, and some are watching it real early Saturday morning, and others are watching it on weeknights, and we're here on an afternoon. And again, for those of you on television, any of you in the area of Tulsa, if you'd like to come in for this taping session, we usually tape one afternoon a month. We put together four half-hour programs right in succession. It's informal. That's why you see the coffee cups. We take a break, come back and tape a half an hour, take a break, and uh, we just have a good time here all afternoon. So if you can get off work or if you're retired and you can come in like most of these here, we just love to have you. Call us on our 800 number again, and we'll be glad to tell you when our next taping session will come about. Again, we'd like to remind you that all these programs are available on the videotapes. Just give us a call, and we'll give you the information. Again, as I've mentioned now the last few weeks in a row, the booklets are available. The first one covers the first 12 half hours, and the second one is now ready covering the next 12 hours, and people seem to enjoy them. I, I refuse to understand how, but they do, and uh, we just give the Lord all the credit. All right, now let's get right back in and pick up where we left off last week. And you remember we were talking about the fact that the church age, God going to the Gentiles with what Paul called his gospel, was something that had been hid from the whole human race. Nobody had any concept of a 1900 and some year period of time where God would go to the Gentiles without Israel. Now, the Old Testament is full of references that Israel, and I mentioned uh, last week or week before where this rabbi in the Jerusalem Post had an understanding that the Messiah naturally would come to Israel and through Israel would bring peace to all the nations of the world. Well, he wasn't very far from wrong according to the Old Testament concept. But I'm going to do something, and I'm going to use what the Lord Jesus did himself as my authority for doing it. And we're going to, we did it, I think, about two years ago, and we're going to take the time to do it again. We're going to go through and hit these Old Testament prophecies that lay out the whole program, and we're going to show how much was accomplished up till the time of Christ's first coming, and that the rest still has to be future. Now, like I said, I get my authority for doing it this way because Jesus did it himself in Luke chapter 4. Now, if you happen to be in Luke 4, drop down to verse 16. Now, this is again during his earthly ministry. Luke 4, verse 16. And so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, right there, I have to stop and remind you, like I remind all my classes constantly, never forget that Jesus' whole three years of ministry was under the law. All oh, people miss that. Everything he taught, everything he said, everything he did was in accordance with the law. And remember, I scream, we're under grace, we're not under law. Now, that should tell you something. But nevertheless, we can come in here and we can learn so much from the Gospels, even though it was all under law. And so he went into the synagogue. See, he was a law-keeping Jew in so many words. And so he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, see, on the Saturday. And he stood up for to read, and there were delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, or the scroll, he found the place where it was written. Now, when he uses the word, he found, now this, this is what I say, you've got to be a stickler for a word. When it says he found the place, what does that indicate? He looked for it. In other words, he had this portion of scripture on his mind and for a purpose. And so he went through the scroll until he came to this portion of scripture, which we'll look at in a minute, was Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. 
Now, he found where it was written, <clears throat> verse 18, and he reads to the synagogue audience. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, that's what he read out loud out of Isaiah. Verse 20, he closed the book or the scroll and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them as they sat there just totally aghast at what he had just said and what he had done. And this is what he came back and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Isn't that something? All right, now let's go back to Isaiah 61 and see what he did. And those Jews in the synagogue knew what he did. Isaiah 61. And we'll begin right at verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. This is what he read now, remember, in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed unto me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, what's the punctuation mark? Comma. What did Jesus put there? Period. You see that? That's where he stopped. He stopped at the end of to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But now what didn't he read? And the day of vengeance of our God. What is that a reference to? Tribulation. See, the 70th week of Daniel. Now this is the prophecy. Now there's no break here in Isaiah. Isaiah has no idea that that seven years is going to be pushed out 1900 and some years into the future. Jesus knew. And so he stopped exactly where this much prophecy would be fulfilled and everything beyond that Jesus knew would be way out into the future. But the 12 didn't know it. The Jews of Jesus' day didn't know it. The prophets that wrote it didn't know it. See? And this is what we have to be aware of, that these things, as Paul wrote, were hid in the mind of God. Now, God wasn't caught off balance and then all of a sudden had to shift gears and change his program. He knew the end from the beginning, but he didn't reveal it. He kept it secret from the whole human race until it was time for it to be revealed. Now, this is what we have to understand. But all right, now read on. The prophecy said... The day of vengeance of our God, the tribulation, to comfort all that mourn and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, the planning of the Lord that he might be glorified. They shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Now you got to stop there a minute. Those of you who have been with me now for 15 or 20 years, what does Exodus 19 promise the nation of Israel? As they came out of Egypt, they're camped around Sinai. The Lord told Moses that if Israel would keep the commandments, they would be a kingdom of what? Priests. See? And here it is. Now, what's the unflowing? What's the program? Christ would come, he would present salvation, the acceptable year of the Lord. Then would come the day of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And what would follow Daniel's 70th week? The kingdom. See? Now, what's left out? 1900 and some years of the church age. Not in here. But everything else is. All right, now let's quickly go back. And like I said, we did this about two years ago, but uh, I hate to do this for people who buy the videotapes and uh, make them uh, either spend a few bucks for two of them when they could have just gone by with one. But for sake of everybody else, we're going to do it again. Come back to Psalms chapter 2. 
And I want you to have your pens ready so that you can prepare yourself for this. Many of you have already done this. And as I give you the next reference, I want you to write it in the margin of your Bible so that if you want to show this to someone, you can just go from reference to reference without having to use a concordance or tax your memory. Don't be afraid to write some things in your margin because after all, this is a book meant to be studied. Psalms chapter 2. We might as well take at least the first six verses in their whole context. Verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now you've got the whole world's population in those two statements. The heathen, of course, are the non-Jew world. The heathen are the Gentiles. And the people are the Jews, the nation of Israel. Together they say vanity of vanity. See, all is vanity. Number two. The kings of the earth set themselves, that is, the rulers of the Gentile nations, and the rulers, that is, of Israel, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, what's that talking about? Well, Rome, Pilate, and the others in authority, consorting with the high priests and the rulers of Israel, to do what? Crucify the Messiah. Now, as the world's leaders there in those final days of Christ's earthly life before he's crucified, what was the hue and cry of the Jews when Pilate said, I see nothing wrong with this man? What did they say? We have no king but Caesar. Away with this man. We'll not have him to rule over us. Crucify him. All right, that's the prophecy, see? They're rejecting his offer of ruling them in a benevolent kingship. And they don't want any part of it. And so they say, break his bands asunder. Now, I'd like to stop a second. Sometimes I take time, maybe I shouldn't. But you see the pronouns here are plural? Where... The people say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, why plural? Remember what I taught you way back in Genesis 1? Elohim is a plurality. It's a Godhead of three, not one. All right, here's the reason for the plural pronoun. Same way back in Genesis 1:26, when God said, let us make man in our image, what are the pronouns? They're plural, see? Because Elohim is a trinity. He's a plurality in the Godhead. Well, anyway, now verse 4. As they were rejecting the offer of Christ's kingship and his kingdom, and they said, away with him, crucify him, what was the attitude of God in heaven? Oh, it said, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Not a laugh of amusement, but a laugh of what? Scorn, ridicule, judgment. The Lord shall have them, that is, the nations of the world, in derision. Then, now we don't know how much time even the Old Testament prophecies allotted for that verse 4, the time of derision. No hint. But what's the immediate thing after that? Then, now that's a time word, he shall speak unto them, that is, the nation of Israel, but also the nations of the world, in his grace and mercy, in his wrath, see? In his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. What is that? The tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And we'll be looking at the verses now that describe that awful period of human history. And then we're going to go back again to Matthew 24, if not in this half hour, certainly in the next one, and see what Jesus says about it. All right, now the tribulation has run its course in verse 5. What comes on the scene in verse 6? Oh, come on, that's right, the kingdom. See, the tribulation runs its course, and yet have I set my king on the holy hill of Zion. There's the kingdom. And then, uh, verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen or the Gentiles for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Whose possession? The Messiah's. 
when he rules and reigns here on the earth. He's not just going to rule and reign over Israel. He's going to rule the whole world. Now there's the Old Testament program in a nutshell, plain as day. All right, but now I said we're going to break it in half or we're going to break it like Jesus did. How much of this prophecy was fulfilled at his first coming? Well, up until the verse that speaks of his wrath and vexation. That never happened. God didn't pour out his wrath in the book of Acts, did he? God hasn't poured out his wrath upon the human race. Oh, we've got a lot of calamities. We've got wars and famine. Hey, that's not the wrath of God. That's just the uh, evidence of the curse. We know nothing of what it's going to be like on this planet when God's wrath is poured out, especially in that last half of the seven years. That's going to be the real vexation. So, you can split that whole prophecy right there between verse 3 and verse 5, that that first part was fulfilled, the Messiah came, offered himself as king, the world rejected him, and in between that, of course, you have to go to Psalms 110, verse 1. Keep your hand here in Psalm 2 for just a second. We'll come back to it. But now in Psalms 110, verse 1, this took place, of course, during the interval between verse 4 and verse 6 in Psalms 2. Psalms 110, verse 1. Now look what it says. The Lord said unto my Lord. Now the casual reader won't see the difference in those two terms, Lord. Where the average reader will just say, well now what is this? One person talking to another? Well in essence it is. But I'm going to show you something. The first Lord is all capitalized. The second Lord is capital L, but small o-r-d. Now, what's the difference? Well, if you know your Old Testament terms of deity, the first Lord is the Jehovah God, and this is one of the few instances where Jehovah does not refer to the Son as much as it does to the Father. But here we have, in essence, God the Father saying to Jehovah Adonai, and Adonai meant master, and that's why Christ is referred to so often as master, even in the New Testament. He was Jehovah, Adonai. So what you have here is God the Father says to God the Son, at the time of his rejection, sit thou at my right hand until. And what's that word until? Time word. Yes, he ascended. And Hebrews tells us that after he had purged us from our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, right in accordance with Psalms 110. And so he ascended and he sat at the right hand, but he's only going to stay there until some point in time when the world is ready for his return. And then, as Psalms 2, now you can come back to Psalms 2, then the Lord says, yet have I set my king on the holy hill of Zion. Oh, it's been interrupted, but does that mean the last half isn't going to be fulfilled? Not at all. It's coming, it's going to be just as sure as everything that went before. All right, now I said I'm going to have you write in your margin. Write in here, the next portion of scripture you want to go to is Psalms 118. Write it here at Psalms 2, though. Then you go to Psalms 118, down to verse 22. <coughs> Psalms 118, verse 22. Now, right about now, I wish I had another two hours. Somebody just said they're going to go back to that truck and put their hands on the clock's hands and keep them from moving, but uh, that wouldn't help us all that much. But Psalms 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Doesn't sound like an awful lot, but hey, that's loaded. Now, who claimed to be the stone and who was the stone, the rock of offense, who presented himself to Israel? Well, Jesus, see, he was to be the headstone of the corner. But what did Israel do? They rejected him. See, they cast that cornerstone aside and it became a stone of stumbling. See? Now, 
you can split that verse right in the middle because, you see, he has not as yet become the headstone of the corner. That will be fulfilled when he returns and sets up his kingdom. So the first half was fulfilled at his first coming. You put a little dash in there and a parenthesis around it, and that's the last 1900 and some years, and the last half is yet going to be fulfilled. He's still going to be the headstone of the corner. He's going to fulfill all these Old Testament problems. Now here in the margin, write Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And I'm not hitting all of them by any means. I'm just hitting the ones that are the easiest to understand. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Y'all there? For unto us, the nation of Israel, they're the us, no one else. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. Now what's that all in reference to? Well, when he sits upon the throne in Jerusalem and sets up his kingdom. All right, now back up. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That happened at his first coming. But he hadn't set up his government as yet. He hadn't set up the kingdom, so you put a dash in there because that's all been pushed out into the future. We don't know how long from now, but it's already been pushed out 1900 and some years. But the prophecy is that the king would come and he would end up by setting up his kingdom. All right, now let's go on to Isaiah 61. That's the one we looked at a moment ago, but let's stop there so you can put your next reference there anyway. Isaiah 61. Now you put your dash or your parenthesis, however you're marking it, right between verse 1 and verse 2 or uh, after the word Lord, I'm sorry, in verse 2, right after the word Lord, where there's a comma, you, know, you put right in there a parenthesis. The rest of that prophecy was pushed out into what is even future from our time. Now go to Joel chapter 2, and it'll be verse 29. And again, write that here in Isaiah. Joel chapter 2, verse 29. Now Joel is just right after Daniel and Hosea, and then you'll come to Joel. Uh, Daniel, I mean Joel chapter 2, verse 29. Joel chapter 2, verse 29. Right, from Isaiah 61, verse 2, right in your margin, Joel chapter 2, well it's between 28 and 29, but You'll see it when you get to it. All right, now Joel. Just keep on coming through the prophets. Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Chapter 2. Let's start verse 28. Now this is the same portion that Peter quoted verbatim in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And again, Peter quoted the whole prophecy because he did not know, like Jesus did, that only half of it would be fulfilled. And so here's what he says. Verse 28, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That happened at Pentecost. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and on the handmaids in those days, I will pour out of my Spirit. That happened at Pentecost, which, of course, was in conjunction with his first coming. But, you see, Peter went right on and read the next verse as though it, too, was going to be fulfilled. And what does it say? I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Did that happen? No. And then the next verse, of course, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Jehovah shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. What's that reference to? The kingdom, see? So you put a parenthesis back there between verse 28 and 29. 
29 and 30 and 31, 32 haven't happened yet. But they're going to. All right, now in this margin, you can write Zechariah chapter 9. Boy, our time's flying. We've got to wind this up. Zechariah chapter 9, right between verses 9 and 10. All right, now Zechariah is the next to the last book in our Old Testament. Now, I always tell people, just go find Matthew and then back up to the left and uh, come through Malachi, and then you'll find Zechariah, chapter 9, now between verses 9 and 10. <coughs> Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, capitalized, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, the colt of an ass. Now then, did that happen? Sure it did. That was fulfilled on the uh, triumphal entry. And then verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the Gentiles. And his dominion or his kingdom shall be from sea even to sea, from river even to the ends of the earth. What's that? The kingdom. See? Did it happen? No. Is it going to happen? You better believe it. But you see, it's been interrupted. There, there's been a period of time put in between there. All right, now I got one more in the New Testament yet, believe it or not. Luke chapter 1 between verses 31 and 32. Luke chapter 1 verses 31 and 32. 31 and 32. Luke 1. Now watch it carefully again. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Did that happen at his first coming? Absolutely. But now look at the next verse. That didn't happen. And he shall be called great, the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Is Christ sitting on David's throne tonight? No. That won't happen until he returns. After the tribulation has run its course, then he will return and he will sit upon his throne in Jerusalem. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, Write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldman.